let's earn ent to actually learn ent like never before hello friends and welcome to one more video of ent by dr pranch mehta and as you all know we were doing external ear we have already done pinna and its diseases now let's move on to the external auditory canal and the tympanic membrane okay so before we start i would like to orient you guys like where is the eac and tm actually located in our body and in which orientation so if you see it is directed from the external auditory meatus medially as well as anteriorly or in forward direction so it is medially directed as well as directed forwards now let's have a look from the side angle view it is directed anteriorly or forwards as we can see as well as a little downwards so overall it's directed medial anterior and downwards so medial forwards and downwards okay now if we want to see this tube from one end to the other that is still the tympanic membrane we need to come in line with this tube so how do we do that by pulling the pinna now we have to pull the pinna exactly in the three opposite directions backwards laterally and upwards so see we'll counteract these medially so we'll counter it by laterally for forwards we'll counter it by backwards and for downwards we'll counter it by upwards so we we'll pull the pinna and we see it now the external auditory canal actually can be divided into two parts that is outer one third and inner two third total length is 24 mm so outer one third that is 8 mm is cartilaginous part and the inner two third that is 16 mm is bony part now the cartilaginous part is actually the same cartilage which makes the pinna it's the same single cartilage which makes outer eac as well as pinna now as you can see the bony part on its anterior wall has a bulge that is because of the glenoid fossa of the temporomandibular joint tmj while talking about the skin the outer one third of the cartilaginous part has thick skin and the bony part which is the inner two thirds has a thin layer of skin this skin is continuous with the outer layer of the tympanic membrane the outer thick skin has pilosebaceous glands which will secrete sebum as well as seminous glands which secrete uh, wax so these are present in the outer part not in the inner bony part where the skin is very thin so whenever pharyngolysis occurs it occurs in the outer one third where the skin is thick and has pilosebaceous glands okay now moving to the relations of the external auditory canal actually these are important because we should know when we do the diseases that where can the infection spread so the inner bony part superiorly is related to the middle cranial fossa inferiorly it is related to the jugular bulb now talking about anterior and posterior uh, anteriorly it is related to temporomandibular joint as well as infratemporal fossa and posteriorly it is related to the mastoid okay so now how does it matter suppose there is infection of the eac that infection suppose causes destruction of bone it can reach the middle cranial fossa and can cause meningitis extradural or subdural abscess now suppose the infection goes downwards inferiorly it can go and infect the jugular bulb causing jugular thrombosis now if the infection spreads anteriorly it will infect the tmj or the infection can go to the infratemporal fossa while posteriorly it will go and affect the mastoid leading to mastoiditis now imagine if the uh, infection is so severe that in, it involves the superior inferior uh, as well as medial and lateral uh, bony walls causing infection in the full skull base we call it as skull base osteomyelitis actually it will be correct to call it as lateral skull base osteomyelitis because it's involving the lateral part of the skull uh, okay so moving forward now we'll go to the tympanic membrane so uh, when we talk about tympanic membrane okay as we've seen it is located at the other end of external auditory canal but it is located at an angle of 55 degrees with the inferior wall as well as the anterior wall it is uh, oval in shape uh, with a diameter of 8 to 9 mm horizontally and vertically it's around 10 mm 9 to 10 mm okay peripherally like at the periphery it's thickened to form a fibrocartilaginous ring which is called the annulus now this fibrocartilaginous ring sits in a groove that groove is called tympanic sulcus and this is present in the tympanic bone now see superiorly this sulcus and this annulus is dehiscent superiorly this is called as the notch of rivenus now this notch of rivenus is a part of squamous part of temporal bone uh, now as you can see the annulus from its anterior part the anterior upper margin and posterior upper margin 
comes to the center forming anterior malleolar fold and posterior malleolar fold not malleolar malleolar that was the previous uh, nomenclature we used to use but now it's not called malleolar it is attached to the lateral process of malleus now see this divides the tympanic membrane into two parts the upper triangular pars flaccida which is not bound by the annulus and the lower pars tensa which is bound by the annulus and pars tensa is the one which is responsible for sound and vibration okay now moving to uh, the shape the tympanic membrane is oriented in such a way that it is concave towards the external ear but if you look closely the individual segments from the periphery to the center are convex so overall it is concave but the individual segments from periphery to the center are convex now uh, as you all know tympanic membrane has three layers outer middle and inner the outermost layer is in continuation with the skin of the external auditory canal so it is formed by the squamous epithelium okay the innermost layer the inner layer or the innermost layer is in continuation with the mucosal layer of the middle ear and then you have the middle layer which is formed by the connective tissue or fibrous tissue this middle layer is very important see it has fibers which are which are organized in different ways from outside or from exterior to interior the outermost fibers are oriented in a, rad a radial manner so from center they are moving to the periphery as we come a little interior a uh, little interior medial we see that the fibers orientation becomes circular now when you come little more further medial you see the orientation of the fibers becoming hyperbolic and the innermost fibers are oriented in a transverse manner the uh, this orientation of the fibers is very important because this is what decides how the sound wave moves whether the sound dissipates from the center to the periphery moves in a circular motion or is the fibrous layer is thick and well developed in uh, pars tensa whereas in the pars flaccida this fibers are not arranged like this they are random and it is a thin layer like it is not a well developed layer it is not thick it is very thin and the fibers are not directed in any particular direction they are random haphazard okay coming to the arterial or the blood supply of tympanic membrane tympanic membrane is exclusively supplied by the external carotid artery system by different arteries obviously so there are there's one artery which supplies it from the side of external artery canal and three arteries from the middle ear side the one from the external artery canal is epidermal branch of deep auricular artery deep auricular artery is a branch of the maxillary artery which in turn is a branch of external carotid from middle ear side there are again three arteries uh, starting with the first one the first artery is the anterior tympanic artery anterior tympanic artery is a branch of maxillary artery only so again external carotid now moving to the second artery second artery is the stylomastoid artery stylomastoid artery is a branch of posterior auricular artery which is again a branch of external carotid the stylomastoid artery uh, enters the temp uh, temporal bone through the stylomastoid foramen uh, uh, from where the facial nerve goes out okay so it gives a branch which is actually posterior tympanic which supplies this tympanic membrane the third artery is middle meningeal artery the middle meningeal artery again is a branch of maxillary artery which again is a branch of external carotid so overall the blood supply of the tympanic membrane is exclusively by the external carotid system not the internal carotid so talking about the nerve supply the nerve supply i have already taught you about this concept in the pinna see the anterior inferior part or the anterior inferior surface of tympanic membrane along with the anterior inferior surface of the full eac till the pinna that is involving the tragus area is supplied by auricular temporal nerve which nerve auricular temporal auricular temporal nerve is a branch of the posterior division of mandibular nerve mandibular nerve is a branch of cranial nerve number 5 that is trigeminal nerve okay the posterior superior part or posterior superior surface of the tympanic membrane along with the full posterior superior wall of the eac external auditory canal till the concha is supplied by vagus that is cranial nerve number 10 and which branch arnold's nerve this is the reason when you poke a earbud or anything inside your ear canal you cough uh, there are some fibers of the facial nerve as well sensory nerve, uh, fibers which supply the same wall now talking about the medial side the surface which is facing the middle ear there it is supplied by the tympanic plexus now tympanic plexus is formed by 
cranial nerve number 9 glossopharyngeal actually it's a tympanic branch which is called jacobson's nerve as well as sympathetic supply which is around the internal carotid artery about this we will read when we do the next video that is anatomy of the middle ear so for today we are done and uh, today we read about the anatomy of eac and the tympanic membrane hope you liked the video and learned something so if you learned something do like and share the video with your friends and don't forget to subscribe to our channel the ent surgeons before closing the doors of your brain